Some say it's the journey that matters more than the destination. But at Kitty Hawk, we feel that the world is headed to a future of sustainable abundance, one that benefits all citizens of this planet and that getting there faster matters. So we seek to accelerate this journey alongside the mission-driven entrepreneurs who relentlessly work to bring this abundant future into the present. This is what drives us forward and what motivates us every day at Kitty Hawk. We see a horizon of golden possibilities ablaze with technologies that improve lives and protect our planet, securing a better tomorrow for us all. So while we agree on the merits of a joyous and mindful journey, we also feel that when it comes to creating a future laden with the best characteristics of humanity, getting there as quickly as possible matters. Kitty Hawk, take flight. Joining us today for the Kitty Hawk Investor Series is Brian Johnson. Brian is a serial entrepreneur, having founded and sold multiple successful companies. Brian's business life has been a diverse one. He started his first company while in college and really hasn't looked back. In 2007, he founded Braintree, an innovative global payments platform. The company was ranked 47 on the 2011 Inc. Magazine's list of the 500 fastest growing companies. Braintree was also the owner of the ubiquitous payments platform Venmo. And in 2018, Brian sold the company to PayPal, which was then part of eBay, for $800 million. Next up for Brian was the OS Fund, which he backed with $100 million of his personal capital. OS is a venture capital fund that invests in companies that use artificial intelligence and machine learning in fields including advanced materials, computationally derived therapeutics, diagnostics, genomics, nanotechnology, and synthetic biology. In 2016, Brian founded Kernel, a brain-computer interface to build hardware that measures and records brain activity. Brian hopes to bring the brain online with Kernel. The company has said the devices may be used to help paralyzed individuals communicate or people with mental health challenges access new therapies. And in late 2021, Brian announced Project Blueprint, an endeavor to measure his 70 plus organs and then maximally reverse the quantified biological age of each. Brian has been making some exciting progress and I'm excited to be able to dive into this in depth today. Please join me in welcoming to the Kitty Hawk Investor Series, Brian Johnson. Brian, welcome uh, to everyone joining us today. Welcome. It is terrific to have you here today. Uh, we are living in a, a really extraordinary time, and it's particularly uh, in terms of what's happening in the field of longevity. Uh, I've been very lucky to have gotten to spend the last couple of years spending uh, a week each summer with Peter Diamandis on a longevity learning trip, getting to meet with scientists and academics and, and entrepreneurs. And it really does feel like we're on the cusp of some extraordinary breakthroughs and getting closer and closer to uh, what Ray Kurzweil has called the longevity escape velocity, where you end up uh, gaining more than a year for for every year that you're alive, and a bunch of folks thinking that may be happening, you know, kind of the late uh, uh, this part of uh, uh, this decade, maybe or early the next decade. Uh, what I'm particularly excited about today, though, is the chance to talk to Brian about what he's doing today. So a lot of those things in the lab are, you know, just that they're things in the lab that are that are out in the distance and. Brian, through Project Blueprint, is really focused on things that that uh, we all can do today to uh, live a healthier and longer life. And so I think it's going to be of interest to uh, a lot of us joining today. Brian, welcome. It's great to see you. I really appreciate your uh, you being here and excited to, to dive in and talk about what you're working on. Thanks for having me. Um, so why don't we start just with that? Let's uh, how about the genesis of Project Blueprint? Kind of what was the the driver here, and and maybe kind of set set uh, you know frame up what you're doing and and how you're going about this. It uh, Blueprint's really about self uh, minimization of self harm. Uh, mm -hmm. Several years ago, I had this problem where every night around seven p.m. I would eat uh, uncontrollably, and sometimes it would be second servings or third servings. Sometimes it would be uh, you know, a treat, a dessert, but really it was about me committing self-harm and I was you know, 50 pounds heavier than I am now. And no matter what I tried, I could not stop myself from doing it. I guess it was, um, 
this moment arrived where I thought, why do I repeatedly commit self-harm? Why can I not stop this? Like, where, where do I send the bug report that like this functioning piece of intelligence makes the same problem hundreds or even thousands of times? And so one day I playfully thought, well, I'm just going to fire the version of Brian that commits to self-harm. So 5 p.m. to 10 p.m., he no longer has authority to eat food, like period, because he is a rascal. He always makes bad decisions. He makes life miserable for everyone else, every, all of the Brian's. And so from that day forward, I fired my conscious mind from 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. When, when was this? Uh, you call a year? Yeah, a couple of years ago. Okay. And uh, it, it started out as kind of a joke of like, hey, this is like a funny thing I'm going to do. But then it turned out to be something much more methodical where it built up in, in a fashion where I thought, okay, instead of me having my mind having unquestioned authority, on what it can do whenever it can have whatever it wants, whenever it wants, for whatever reason. And there's always an infinite number of reasons why my mind gets what it wants. I thought if I could measure my body and I could enable my heart and my lungs and my liver to speak so they could make, they could voice what they want. Then I could make that list of requests. That could be the grocery shopping list and the eating plan. And then that happens. And so demotion of my conscious mind, an elevation of self, which includes all my 78 organs. And so that's really what Blueprint has evolved to become is this observation that my mind is oftentimes a rascal, gets me into trouble repeatedly. It can't quite get itself under control if I elevate other parts of self and I systematize it that I can minimize self-harm and achieve uh, the best health of my life. Okay, so uh, if I understood that correctly, you are basically uh, uh, tracking, I'm guessing you're using all sorts of measurements, doing blood work, I mean, you'll take us through that, but basically to be able to quantify exactly what is happening in your body and using that information to be able to drive, you know, what you're doing, what you're eating, how you're acting, how you're kind of living your life. That's right. So if you take an example and you say, all right, heart, what do you need to be perfectly happy? So there's a, a measurement protocol of how do you ask the heart what it wants? Well, you can measure it with blood pressure and uh, VO2 max and our plaques, and you can look at uh, EEG, EKGs, and you can do MRIs and ultrasound, all of which we do. But you can measure it. You can probably generate a few dozen markers on the heart and say, how does the heart look? What does it need? And that generates uh, a list. And then you reference that against scientific evidence, and there's your, your list. And so then the heart gets to directly determine the inputs, uh, not only just for diet, but also sleep and exercise. And so you're really inquiring to the body, what do you need to be in an ideal state? And, and how often for the heart, for example, how often are you taking measurements and, and kind of adjusting what you're doing based on those measurements? Constantly. Like multiple times a day? I'm, on some, yeah. I mean, for example, the wearables, uh, like an Aura or a Whoop, uh, is daily, uh, ultrasound, monthly, MRI, quarterly. So every different modality has a different measurement type. Okay, gotcha. So so let's step back again and kind of uh, maybe frame up a little bit about, you know, what what is the routine? What are you, you know, how do you divide up the various uh, elements? And, and I don't know, maybe, I don't know if that's easier to kind of think about in terms of what does a typical day look like for you? Yeah. It, uh, a few years ago, I, I started going to bed early, like 8.30 p.m. And my friends are oftentimes make fun of me. Like, you know. <laughs> I remember being at a dinner with you at your home <laughs> and uh, we had to end pretty early because uh, just because of that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I started thinking through like, how could I make this socially acceptable? And I started to explain, like, I, I take my job as an entrepreneur seriously. I want to be in great condition. I want to be emotionally stable. I want to be able to make good decisions. I don't want to treat other people uh, and, you know, I don't want to be irritable with other people. Like I want to be in a positive emotional and physical state. And so I take my lifestyle very seriously, almost like a professional athlete. Mm -hmm. And so as I started working more on blueprint and my protocol started getting a bit more robust, I started playing with this concept. Let me show you uh, this screen here, this image. Yeah, I started playing around with this, with this idea of, if there was such a thing as being a professional rejuvenation athlete, what would it look like? Like we know what a professional basketball 
player's training regimen looks like. And, you know, we know this general profile, but when you think about people who are uh, looking at uh, their life as a, as a office worker or something else, we don't really think about our lives in terms of us being athletes or professional athletes. And so if, mm. if we try to say that we're maintaining some kind of protocol, then people around us typically bucket it like, oh, that's a healthy person or that's a blank person. There's not really a good category and it creates this social friction. And so I've been playing with this idea of if like we were to say we are at a point in time with the science of rejuvenation, that one could take it seriously and there could actually be a path for rejuvenation Olympics. What would a person's daily protocol look like? And so this is just a sampling of, you can see through images, all the stuff we do, but we're looking at every organ of the body. Uh, we use evidence only back protocols. So we don't do a trendy thing. It's it got to be by gold standard scientific evidence and it's got to be um, through clinical guidelines. So I'll take that slide. So, yeah. Can you touch on that just a little bit more? So, so when you say, uh, you know, backed by science and scientific evidence, like what do you need to see in order to feel comfortable that, that uh, one of these things is really efficacious? I mean, it's got to be a random controlled trial. I mean, it's got to okay. be, uh, yep, it's got to be good science. Um, I mean, everything enters into the risk benefit ratio, but uh, we want to, we need to be able to measure at a baseline. Where are you at now? Look at the intervention to find there's appropriate evidence, implement that at protocol, and then measure again. And what I found is I, as I've socialized more in this community, because I'm new to the new to the community. There's a lot of discussion at the layers of abstraction, like, you know, is a carnivore diet good for you or a vegan diet? Is this or that? And it's at these abstraction layers that remind me of these debates you'd see in religion or other parts where hmm. uh, it's, it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is data. Uh, so I'm agnostic, whether it's carnivore or vegan. Well, that's not entirely true. Uh, ethically and morally, I am very happy that I'm vegan. Um, that said, I didn't go into it trying to justify being vegan. It was the point of, can my body achieve an ideal state of wellness independent of any layer of abstraction, just looking at data. And so it's always measurement first, then evidence, then implementation, and then the, the cycle repeats itself again. And, and so where have you come out on the, uh, on the, the food and kind of nutrient front? What is your, what does your diet look like? I'm vegan except for collagen peptides. And so okay. hopefully I can get rid of those soon too. Gotcha. And those just do not exist other than from an animal source. Yeah. A few people are working on it. I hope to be able to eliminate that. Yeah. But yeah. But I basically be able to achieve all my objectives being vegan. Okay. So, um, can we talk a little bit about kind of the different, uh, buckets of things that, that you were doing? So, uh, I know like when we had, uh, David Sinclair on, we were talking about some of the supplementation that he and, and people like Peter are doing. Are you, can, can we talk a little bit about yeah. kind of what you're doing there? Yeah, sure. Uh, let me pull up this slide. So this is my uh, latest stats as of like a, a month ago. And so the, I guess the question is, is Blueprint working? If so, to what degree? What, yeah, what, what are the state of things? And th so this is a current panel I have. And so really in this part of conversation, typically people would say, well, I do this supplement, I do that supplement, I do this kind of, but again, really the only thing that matters is data. Right. Unless someone shares data, it's pointless to hear the opinion. And so this is, again, it's measurement, evidence, data, and repeatedly. So it covers quite a range of thing of liver enzymes, you know, body fat, grip strength, you know, like you can see the list and it's in a, I mean, I'm pretty close to being uh, similar to my 17 year old in terms of my, my general panel. And where, where did you start? <laughs> a long way from this. I mean, this is like the thing, um, you know, I was building Braintree. I had this, sadly, I accepted the societal norms that it's expected when you're uh, an entrepreneur, you grind yourself into the ground. It's just expected as like a warrior signature. Yeah, oh, you right. see someone and they're just haggard. And it's like, right. I worked 90 hours last week. Yeah. Right. Oh, good yeah. for you. Amazing. <laughs> right. People socially signal. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, the, like, their lack of sleep and their, even their haggardness is like a badge of honor and they sleep into the desk and three days of not sleep. And it, I think it really, that is a, an old era. I think there's a few people who have still stuck to that, but basically 
you're just burning down your life right. handle uh, at this staggering rate and it's silly. And so sadly, I was doing that. I had accepted those norms without questioning it. So yeah, I was in a pretty bad state. And so these, these markers uh, are a substantial turnaround from where I was at. Yeah, what's, what really strikes me here is you are kind of, I don't know, maybe the best example of personalized medicine uh, in some ways, right? I mean, you're really looking at all the different uh, elements of your body and then doing things to address all those specific things. And how many, in total, how many uh, things are you tracking? Yeah, let me, I'll show you this next slide here. This is just a, a sampling right. of things that we've measured. Okay. It's not everything, but it's, we've hundreds of measurements and these just happen to be younger than my chronological age. So there's a lot more. I have many measure, uh, markers, which are substantially older than my chronological age, which I need to bring down. But it gives you, all right, we take that down. But and, it gives you an idea. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think I would say, um, like the, I frame this as a rejuvenation athlete game because it's fun. Like when, when there's competition, humans gather. And so if my the thought exercise provokes others to want to be better, mission accomplished. Like it, it right. really is an endeavor to say, let's have the entire field engage in a systematic process right. of sharing data and then sharing protocols. I open sourced my whole protocol. And so it's really, I'm trying to elevate the entire field by doing this. And I would put forward the hypothesis and say that I'm currently the most measured person in the world. Now, if there's others who are more measured than me, great. Like, we'd love to hear about it. Right. And I'd also say that my protocol is the best in the world uh, because of the data I have in the markers. Now, again, if there's others better, great. Then share the data and make your protocol known. But it really is an endeavor to try to bring out and make a systematized effort. Like, for example, if we had like a rejuvenation Olympics and we had people sharing markers and protocols, it might move things along at a speed that we may all find more satisfying than basically getting together in these conversations and saying, well, you know, this drug's in, you know, phase two or phase three, and we just end up waiting years and years and years, nothing happened. Meanwhile, all of our aging clocks are moving forward. And so maybe it's a way for us to inject some enthusiasm for us to do more. Yeah. I, I love that. Uh, I have a company actually, I'm going to want to share with you that uh, is working to kind of help uh, share best practices and bring people together around, around some of this stuff. Um, so, and you, how many years have you kind of reversed your, your uh, age, would you say, based on, on the data you've been tracking? Uh, let me see. I think I have, yeah, let me pull up this slide. So this is actually old. I need to update this. I okay. believe this is, um, like maybe eight months old, but yeah, we, um, we have a few hundred aging clocks, yeah. which, uh, we look at. And so these are just uh, a sampling. I mean, there's a lot of debate on what, how one measures age. Right. And, you know, people can dissect it from like a molecular level and all these different levels, you know, and I guess I, I kind of think like the human eyes are potentially the best age assessment tools we have. Like we all know what a 10 year old looks like and a 20 year old and a 30 year old and a 40 year old and 50 year old. And we all know their general characteristics and their physical abilities. And so in the, in the age markers we've looked at, we've been marking hundreds of clocks. So we, again, we measure everything. We look at these from a biological age uh, measurement from statistical criteria of what these things look like, what the characterization is. Like, for example, you can look at my heart and you can age characterize it via dozens of markers. And so we'd look at all those things. And then I, at that slide, we just pulled up my epigenetic age. Uh, as far as we know, this was a world record of reversing my epigenetic age 5.2 years in seven months by following this protocol. Now, like with epigenetics and with these tests, like you have to really take this with a grain of salt uh, because it's, it's still an emergent science. People are excited about it, but, you know, but I guess we are seeing indicators in a lot of these things which are uh, meaningful. And so... Are, you know, hopefully we're on the right trajectory. It's difficult because the science is not there entirely, but hopefully they're encouraging signs. Yeah. I mean, maybe most meaningfully, uh, how are you feeling? Like, have yeah. you noticed <laughs> changes in, you know, your cognitive abilities and how rested you feel and kind of your energy levels? Uh, so I would say, you know, I, I run a trail 
here in LA with my boys, my 17 or 19 year old boys, it's a thousand feet up. It's 3.4 miles in total. I can beat them the entire time, save the last 500 meters. And so, I mean, outside of my subjective assessment of telling you that I feel fine or great, like right. whatever, I don't believe those things as much. Uh, I'm able to physically hang and mentally hang with my boys at almost every level. And so, um, I don't think that was the case before. Gotcha. Well, you certainly look a lot younger than, than you are. So, you know, the aesthetic piece seems to be working. And I've seen uh, some video of you with uh, without your shirt on uh, working out. And, and that's uh, pretty extraordinary <laughs> what you've uh, the physique you've you've built. So, um, you know, it seems to be uh, working in, in many different ways. We've got a lot of folks, you know, listening and who will watch this uh, who probably, you know, don't have access to the team you have and resources and maybe not the the discipline to be tracking all these things and and following such a detailed program i, I was kind of curious if there's you know two or three things that uh you have found to be the most impactful and the most meaningful or just kind of knowing you're speaking to a broader audience um are there things that that you would really encourage people to to focus on yes there's a few things um Oftentimes when we, when we think about longevity, it's an orientation where we think it's an outside thing coming in. So we are going to take a pill or we're going to do a thing. Uh, but I think of this really as an inside out. Uh, mm -hmm. my, my current uh, pace of aging is 0.76 from my most recent DNA methylation test using uh, the Denudin pace uh, DNA methylation model. So, so, so what does that mean, 0.76? So for every year of chronological time that passes, I age 0.76 of that year. So, okay. So you are potentially the first person to achieve longevity escape velocity. There's two things here. So one is there's the speed of aging. So yep. I'm currently roughly 25% slower than chronological time. Okay. And then there's an element where I need to figure out how to reverse the aging that does happen. And so mm. it's, gonna be, it's unlikely we're going to be able to stop the aging processes. Like we're all going to age at some speed. So the key is getting that to be as slow as possible. And then we need to reverse the aging that has happened already. And so for the past 18 months, really the, the objective has been slow my speed of aging as much as possible. And so, you know, the 0.76 is a respectable number and for the past few months, we've been focusing much more on rejuvenation. So how do I reverse the age of my body of all the different markers I'm looking at? And so I think that I'm excited for the next year or two because that's really where most of the action is going to come for us. We've been building up for this moment because to do some of the more advanced therapies in the regeneration, you really need to have solid baseline measurement markers. You don't want to go into this blind. You want to know where everything's at. You want to know where all systems are. It needs to be very tightly done. And so this next two years, I think is going to be very exciting. And that's really where I think we can look at age escape velocity. And I think it might be one of the most significant moments for the human race. If we reconcile and we say aging is not inevitable, we can dramatically slow it. We can in fact reverse it. And that our relationship with time and life and planning and each other starts changing on time scales. It would just alter the psychology of the human race. And so in the next couple of years, I hope we can make steps towards demonstrating that um, there is a progress bar we're on somewhere. Uh, we'll see where. Yeah, but you, you have to keep, so I guess like to answer your question, Will, the first thing I think is useful well, for me was to basically stop self-harm. Instead of thinking it like, what pill can I take? Right. We all know the versions of ourselves that are rascals that mm. stay up too late, late, drink too much alcohol, like, you know, binge on the blank, like whatever it may be. Those are the things that accelerate aging. And so if your aging clock is 1.2 or 1.3 years, so if you're aging faster than time, and we all see, we all know people in our lives are like this, maybe it's us, uh, slow that down first just by stopping self harm. I think self harm may be the singular insight for the early 21st century of we are a self 
harm society. And it's so normalized. Yeah, it's really interesting to me that you were able to essentially kind of in a cold turkey, you know, kind of manner, just flip a flip a switch. And I think for so many people, you know, the with alcohol or overeating, those are very hard uh, switches to, to flip. Did you have, you know, I know you're a very disciplined guy uh, by your nature uh, in, in many, many ways. Um, like, how did you actually do that? Was there any real trick there? Or did you just have kind of an ability to, to kind of say, I'm, you know, I'm not going to do this anymore? So it, was, it wasn't actually a switch. It was actually, I think I probably made like, so my learning algorithm probably needed something like 75 to a hundred mistakes mm. where I would, I would arrive at 7 PM at night. I would have this overwhelming desire to eat, right? Bad stuff. And I would look at the situation and then my mind would spin up dozens and dozens of reasons why it was a good idea to eat, even though everything inside of me knew it was wrong. And so I got to a point where I could model it out and I could simulate and say, okay, I know if I do this thing, I know how I'm going to sleep. I know how I'm going to feel tomorrow. I know how I'm going to interact with other people. And so I could model it all out. And so there was no more surprise. And I could say, you know what? I choose not to do this because I know exactly what's going to happen. And so for whatever reason, and I've, as I've watched my son as well, my 17 year old, he went through almost an identical situation with me where, you know, in the morning, like, dad, I messed up. Like, it's all right. It's fine. Like, what number are you at? You know, 32, 33. But he finally hit a point uh, in his trajectory where he's, uh, identical to me where we both have near perfect adherence to this wow. uh, so we've gone through it enough times but it just takes a little time and now it's like it's so unimaginable to us that we actively engage in self-harm it's not like oh do we allow ourselves to binge day because we love it like it sounds awful like we feel awful we sleep awful like why do it it's terrible and how long did it take you to get to that point is that three month effort to kind of yeah, really six months, six settle months, into that six months six months or so yeah okay yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, I stopped, uh, my wife doesn't drink and, and uh, I've slowly kind of almost completely stopped drinking. And I'm now at a point now where, you know, I just know as soon as one, a single yeah. glass of wine or something, and I will not sleep as well. I don't feel as productive the next day and it's just yeah. not worth it anymore. And exactly. uh, so kind of extrapolating that into, into yeah. other different um, uh, activity areas. And Yeah. Um, well, like okay. one of the common with Will is like, if, if you, I read a ton of history and if you look back to the ages you see individuals and groups make insight into a big thing of their time, you know, whether it's earth center of the universe or not, you know, whether it's evolution or whatever the case may be, I think self-harm may be that for us. Like, it, like in a few decades of time, they may look back at us and say, well, that's us looking back at ourselves because we're still alive. But <laughs> basically saying like, can you believe that humans used to systematically commit self-harm. They built a society that encouraged people to commit self-harm. It was so normalized. No one had any awareness that it was actually even a thing. And I, I think that could be the case. And it's the thing maybe that holds us back more than anything else is just our uh, normalization, obliviousness to that we do this so thoroughly. Well, and a, uh, a system, a capitalistic system that yeah. encourages this in many ways, That's like, right. amazing businesses, right. Are built right. around, around that piece. And, uh, hopefully that is a, a positive evolution we see over time to the, to the capitalistic system, um, uh, where there is more alignment around, you know, overall outcomes for, for humanity. Um, so, uh, okay. So do no self-harm, uh, are there any other kind of major buckets like, I don't know, like sleep or exercise or nutrition or supplementation. Yeah. You know, if you were to look at, at those four areas or anything else you think that's important. Yeah, let me pull the line here. Okay. So this, yeah, this is what I would say. So I currently consume 1,977 calories a day. Uh, that was the year I was born. That's why I did it. And it's roughly 24% fewer calories than would otherwise be uh, advised for my mm -hmm. age weight. And so I'm in, I'm doing caloric restriction and this is one of the most evidence-based longevity things somebody can do. And so, uh, what, what's your intake uh, window? Uh, yeah, actually I can pull that, uh, in a second. So, uh, eat fewer calories than you need. Uh, 20% is great. Uh, but you really need to do it with optimal nutrition. 
because you don't want to deprive yourself of critical things. So it'd be great if you had a nutritionist, someone who could do this with you. And by the way, my entire protocol is open source and on my website. Uh, and two, uh, treat, uh, treat sleep like a lighthouse. This story really stuck with me. There's a, a captain that gets uh, woken up at night, goes to the, the ship, and, and there's another approaching uh, group. And the captain says, you know, I'm this person, change your course 20 degrees blank. And then the other group signals back and says, you know, I'm, uh, no, you change your course 20 degrees blank. And then the, the general's like, I'm a blank star blank doing this command and this command, like just flexing all the authority, you change. And the other guy comes back and says, I'm a lighthouse. And it, to me, you know, That's sleep awesome. yeah. is, a, is a lighthouse. Uh, we are, we all know the game. We are doing something for work or we are with friends or we're watching a movie. And the first thing to get sacrificed in life is sleep. We think we can make it up. We think we're okay. We, we, whatever. For me, uh, sleep is a lighthouse. No matter what authority I have in life, I cannot say I am Brian Johnson and I am doing blank. It's a lighthouse. And so every night, 8.30 PM, I'm in bed. And so the exceptions are few and far between, but sleep is probably, you know, sleep and diet are the two best medicines. If you're trying to, to slow your rate of aging, you of course can, can chase metformin and rapamycin and spermidine. And like, you can like go out and try to body biohack your way to that stuff, but really getting the basics uh, right is the most important thing. Probably has the biggest yield. And then otherwise, Everything's open source on my website. So if you can't get the basics done, stop self-harm. You can start implementing the higher levels of diet and supplements, stuff like that. Awesome. Um, and are you doing anything on kind of the hormone replacement front or have a perspective there on that? That seems to be kind of a, a growing uh, trend and in, in getting a lot of uh, interest and in, in kind of attention right now. Yeah, I didn't need, uh, I have testosterone therapy. I use an am, uh, androderm patch, two milligrams daily. And my testosterone was fine for quite some time. Then I went down to the 1900 range of cal uh, calories and I couldn't maintain my testosterone anymore. And so it's just mm -hmm. an effect of the diet. So I currently do two milligrams daily of a patch and my levels are about 800. About 800. Okay, great. Um, so I, I want to open this up for, for questions, but before I do that, I want to do uh, a quick little rapid fire, uh, Q and a here with you, uh, just to kind of wrap things and uh, do these with most of our, our speakers here. So, uh, just real quickly, how about best film or series you watched during the pandemic? Uh, you know, I'll say one that I saw last week, which is really on my mind, everything, everywhere, all at once. Hmm. I mean, I think we all know that Super things cool. are really off right now in the world right. and it's hard to put your finger on exactly what's going on. And it doesn't feel like anyone has a plan and it feels like we're kind of in trouble. And uh, I guess I, that entire movie, I just kept on thinking of blueprint of like blueprint is a plan of health and wellness. Yes. It is also a plan for humanity. Uh, we didn't get into that, but like, I guess um, it really captured my attention because of how it captured the zeitgeist at this moment. Terrific. How about a recent book that had an impact on you? Uh, zero, the biography of a dangerous idea. Hmm. Okay. I haven't heard about that. Yeah. Zero is one of the most influential ideas, yeah. concepts and realities. In, right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. When did that, uh, when did the concept of zero, do you recall first, uh, uh, I don't know, was born, I guess. So interesting to think about a world before zero. Exactly. And yeah. if you would be, uh, it's such a delight to read because mm. it found its way through philosophy, empires, math, theology. I mean, it permeates all of society. And so I now, I, I created uh, this concept of zeroth principle thinking. So a lot of people are familiar with first principle thinking and doing so they forget about zeroth, just like everyone else thought about zero before. Mm. Zeroth principle thinking is a novel way to try to think about reality. Hmm. Very interesting. What, uh, what makes you most optimistic about the future? You know, uh, technology has been on a terror uh, of improvement for quite some time. Humans have stayed the same. And this is such a difficult concept for humans to understand. We mistakenly think that we are our technology. 
we think when a new version of the iPhone comes out that we've upgraded ourselves too. And we say, we have GPS in our pockets in a world computer. But if you, if the power goes off, we are the same form of intelligence that was thousands of years ago. Humans, we have more knowledge, but we're basically the same. And so what gives me hope is if we say, if, can we imagine that humans can scaffold their own improvement to degrees that are also on a stunningly impressive curve, I think we're there. So what gives me optimism is that the things that have plagued human progress, human progress, not technological progress, human progress, are, in, are entering into the world of engineering and we can now map out a possibility of moving past our former selves, which are, you know, chaotic and difficult to- Right, work. right, super interesting. So how about the, uh, the other side of the coin there? What, uh, what makes you uh, most pessimistic? You know, I think other people have that, that category solved with their opinions. Gotcha. Yep. I try to try to stay away from that, uh, putting too many uh, cycles and focusing around all the negative stuff going on. And, um, you know, I think is we both believe this is really an extraordinary time to be alive. And if you look at the data, it's the best time to ever be alive. But uh, one of those things you don't get a great sense of by, uh, by reading the news. Um, I, mean, I would say, I'd say one quick response is like, yeah. I'm, I'm incredibly optimistic because I guess I'm in the trenches with these companies doing nanotechnology and synthetic mm. biology and all these different technologies. I see what's coming you know, before the world will see in the next 10 or 15 years. And it's just unbelievably powerful. And so I do think that we're going through this difficult time as a species, but I do think we can scaffold a way out of it. I see to me, all the elements are in place that are going to make us start imagining our future in ways where we say human aspiration, uh, the ambitions we have about ourselves, is the number one priority we have as, as a world. Instead of us mm. focusing on our technology, we'll be focused on ourselves. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, what age do you think you'll live to? Uh, this, I guess I like to think of this question of when I arrive every day, uh, you know, 829 before I go to sleep and I pose this question, do I want to live tomorrow? You know, up until this day, every, every day, the answer has been yes. I want to live until I arrive at 8.29 p.m. And the answer is no. Hmm. But otherwise, I want an indefinite number of tomorrows. Gotcha. Interesting. Um, and uh, if you could have dinner with anyone alive or deceased, uh, who would that be? I want to talk to biology. Hmm. I want to understand the intelligence of biology. I want to understand its essence, its intelligence, its models. Super cool, Brian Johnson. Uh, thank you for all those uh, all those insights. Um, I want to now uh, turn it over to uh, some of our uh, listeners, our uh, LPs and advisors and CEOs and friends who are joining today and uh, give them a chance to ask some questions. So um, you can use the raise hand button, folks, to indicate that you've uh, got a question to ask. Um, and I think we'll Start this off, uh, Spencer uh, Gerol. If you don't mind kicking us off with uh, the first question, that would be uh, that would be wonderful. Nice to see you, my friend. Hey, <laughs> thanks, Will. Brian, um, this you are an incredibly inspirational person for all of us um, because sometimes we just need a model to look at and and think, wow. Uh, somebody's doing it, the thing that we all sort of dream of doing and therefore it's possible to do. So it's, it's wildly inspirational and thank you for that. You mentioned something that you said, we didn't talk about this, but, and you talked about something more grand um, with respect to how Blueprint is a plan for the world, I think was the phrase that you used. And I wanna hear more about that. That's very intriguing. Yeah, thank you for your kind words. I appreciate that. So if you, at the base, really what's happening on planet Earth is we're trying to figure out cooperation. Can humans cooperate with each other? Can we cooperate with the Earth? Climate change is a result of us not cooperating with the Earth. And so if you say that, how would we possibly achieve cooperation? People in the past have said, how do you achieve world peace? Or how do you achieve this kind of state? Well, oftentimes we think about looking at the problem of doing it to others. But we, uh, 
individually are at war with ourselves. Like I know internally to me, the warring factions and nation states within Brian, like everyone's battling, everyone hates each other, there's chaos. So my first objective was how could I achieve world peace inside of Brian? And I did that, uh, at least with my body. Now my mind is still like a battle zone of thoughts and negativity and self-talk, but at least for my body, I've achieved peace. And I did it through a system of demoting my conscious mind, elevating measurement, looking at scientific literature, measurement, data, implementation, and there again. And so if we say, okay, that's a system that works to reckon to, to goal alignment. Oh, there's also this discussion of like, how do you goal align with AI? What does that even mean? Like, we aren't even goal aligned within ourselves, let alone each other. Like, what, how are we going to then goal align with AI? We, we don't have shared incentives. We don't have a common goal. And so if you start taking that process and say, I can achieve a goal alignment within me, then I then you and I can achieve goal alignment and then we can achieve goal alignment with the earth, but you could blueprint the earth. You could have millions of sensors around the earth measuring, asking earth, what do you want? And then you look at evidence, you bring it back in, you say, our society, here's your constraints, demote the conscious mind. You don't get what you want when you want, whenever you want it. There's a system at play here. And we all know of our self-destructive tendencies. And so to me, it really is a systematic approach from the ground up, from inner self to each other, to the world and with computational systems of intelligence that we need to figure out how to cooperate. Spencer, you being here answer, as expected. So I will. Uh, no, I was just going to say, I mean, uh, you being here, uh, Spencer uh, has a company called Spark Neuro that is uh, uh, doing some incredible work around um, uh, brain science and uh, and I made me uh, wonder kind of how you're thinking about cognition, Brian, and and brain health and what you're doing there uh, to try to you know either reverse the age of your brain or en enhance the health of your brain. Yeah, the I guess I, the, the reason I started Kernel was we all know that if we if we buy a car, it's going to fit inside the lanes on the road if we buy a washer and dryer is gonna fit through our front door. We've built engineering standards in society that allow us to scaffold. We don't need to do these things again. And so if you can measure the mind in a systematic way, you can scaffold society. You have a chance of scaffolding society in a way that is positive for everybody. And so right now it's just the wild, wild west. I mean, for example, like we, we build traffic lights, red, yellow, and green based upon the physics of human reaction time, of braking, of you know, identification. So when, where we do have measurements of the brain and whatnot, we, we do create systems, but what about systems for everything else we do? And right now the brain is largely this thing where we just self-reflect and say, how do I feel? It's kind of as preposterous as I try to manage the health of my heart and how I feel about my heart. Like, no, like you need like dozens of measurements to see the health of my heart. I'm not just going to introspect and be like, well, I think it needs blank. Same for our brains. We have this thing where because we feel like we're conscious, we feel like that's a robust sensor system that can detect all things in our brain. And so if we could systematically measure it in a way that gave us insight into what was happening with our brain on a daily basis when it interacted with things, we could potentially try to engineer society in a systematic way, whereas right now it's pretty wild. And so are you using kernel right now as part of your, your tracking? And if you are, maybe can you, uh, we touched on it briefly in the intro, but maybe tell people a little bit more about, you know, what's happening, uh, what's happening there. It kernel, the objective was to build a, a technology that could make brain measurement mainstream hmm. so that if you ever wanted to pose a question, what does sleep do to the brain? What does supp this supplement do to the brain? What, do, what does gaming do to the brain? What is social media? What about you know, uh, a certain, being around certain friends? What about early cognitive decline? What about anxiety, depression, schizophrenia? Anything with the brain, can you measure it systematically? And can you come up with insights in terms of what's happening? And in doing that, it would create a feedback loop so other people can say, oh, great. Now we have a stable measurement base. We can now look to do things to change it. And so, uh, uh, currently it's difficult because fMRI is great quality, but it's too big and expensive. EEG doesn't quite cut it with the quality of mainstream measurement. So we built a technology, it took us five years to do a full stack. We built everything from the ASIC all the way up. 
we built a device that we believe has the potential of punching through to be mainstream. So the technology is built, we're now working to demonstrate the first application that it's, you know, like we, I, I did ketamine recently uh, with flow on my head uh, because mm. a lot of people are doing ketamine uh, treatments. Uh, we did this on healthy volunteers. I was a pilot participant. And the question was, what does the brain look like on ketamine? So I measured my brain five days before, uh, for 10 minutes a day for five days before, mm. during ketamine, and then for 30 days after, what happens to the brain over that time horizon when somebody takes ketamine? And, and so what did you like, say? Uh, it was amazing. It was, I, I have really cool, uh, there's great data and graphs to show. Amazing. Uh, it really helps approach, it, it, you can, instead of just inquiring, hey, Brian, what was it like to take ketamine? We've got data over a long period of time. So it really helps to stabilize the conversation from my fickle memory and fickle uh, subjective assessment. So we're trying to begin, bring about engineering and stability of engineering to make progress of our brain and minds. Hmm. Love it, super exciting. Uh, I'm gonna pull up Andrew Hessel now, a Kitty Hawk advisor um, for another question. Oh, hi, Brian. Thanks uh, very much, Will. This is terrific. Brian, I'm interested if you're doing any uh, archiving or biobanking of, of any of your samples for additional studies um, over time as new technologies are available. Yes, we, we have been biobanking quite a bit. Uh, I don't think we've looked at it extensively, but we have been trying to do some basics. So it's a, I think it's a good question and we should probably look into doing more of it. What, for, for those of us who aren't familiar with biobanking, what, what does that mean? It's pretty much as it sounds, uh, Will. It, it's basically taking any biological sample. It could be blood, tissue, uh, et cetera, and just, and just archiving the physical bio, biological materials for further studies. I see. Gotcha. Being able to access those down in the future, potentially to help with regeneration and yeah, right now our technologies for doing these assays, as, as Brian has just shared, are, yeah. are, are still developing. Not yeah. all of them are as sensitive as we'd like them to be, um, but uh, our, our cells, tissues, and other, uh, and other biological materials are quite stable if properly stored. Hmm. Gotcha. Interesting. Thanks, Andrew. Um, Brian, any, any big surprises as you've gone down this, uh, this path? You know, anything that really you know, it's been a huge aha for you. And the answer may be no. I mean, it really, it's, it's measurement. Yeah. It's like, um, uh, so like behind me, you know, I have a medical grade, hospital grade ultrasound machine. Um, I have a couple lasers and so I guess like I, um, this endeavor, I spend more on my body annually than LeBron James does. Can, can I ask kind of what your your annual budget and what your team looks like to help uh, pull this all off? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, LeBron has said publicly he spends 1.5 million. Okay. So you know, my budget is allocated towards that kind of equipment. Like uh, I think that'll for some machines, like uh, I think 50 to 80 grand or something like that. Uh, so it's building up, it's buying the infrastructure, buying the hardware, it's having a team. It's about 20 specialists around the world. Uh, we've been trying to find specialists per organ. So a specialist in the heart and the lungs and all mm. that kind of stuff. Um, and so really the, the, uh, my objective here is, um, if we could remap, okay. So I guess, um, any, every generation can look at the horizon of opportunities and they can say, what do we think is the, the reach of our generation in the sixties, it was going to the moon, right? Like technically possible, but like, man, that's pretty hard to, to imagine someone pulling off. If we were to say in 2022, what is that thing? It's potentially to neutralize aging. And but then not, potentially reverse it, reverse it. When you say neutralize, do you mean just hold steady or do you mean not to age? Well, I'm saying that we're all gonna age at a certain pace. So hopefully we can get the aging down and then we can reverse the aging that has happened, but we can roughly stay the same age through the slowing of aging and the reversals. Gotcha. And not just for the wealthy, but if we can show it and then make the case that this should be the default structure for society, we shouldn't applaud ourselves for getting people to commit self-harm. 
this should be a default state for everyone. Society should build itself around it. Right now, the individual is outmatched. Like we, all of us are. Like when we have our willpower against advertising and TikTok algorithms and watch the net, next episode on Netflix, we are outmatched. Like it is unbelievably hard to keep our shit together. And society is not helping us. And so in 2022, uh, I think the interesting thing is if we said, if we can imagine ourselves stepping up and saying, we know things aren't right. Like we can all feel it. They're just wrong in a lot of ways. How do we make it right? And getting ourselves to a stable base where everyone's in a stable base, uh, I think would be a large step forward. It might stabilize us. Like, I mean, I know when I deviate from, like when I travel for a certain amount of time and I'm off my protocol for a day or two, like, man, my mind starts like going to different places and my emotions are all over. So I don't know. I, I think it really is worthy to question what's deserving of our best aspirations in this moment. Yeah, I love that, Brian. Um, 100% with you. I think for humanity to evolve uh, and to kind of create the world that, that we want, we have to make huge progress uh, in these areas. Um, so really applaud what you're what you're uh, doing and how you're thinking about it. Uh, I want to pull up next um, uh, one of the founders of one of our portfolio companies, actually the company that I mentioned earlier that's working on an interesting solution that might be uh, of interest to you down the road, uh, Aaron Lee uh, Zucker. Hey, Aaron. Thanks so much, Will. And uh, Brian, thank you so much. This is tremendously inspiring. Uh, and inside our company, we've passed the Blueprint protocol around many times. So uh, it's really a pleasure to, to get to hear all this directly. Uh, I'd like to ask about your thoughts on the role of the individual and uh, the relationship between the individual's uh, participation in the future of, of health and wellness and driving us towards that moment of longevity, escape velocity, and the privacy implications mm -hmm. of the unfolding technologies that are, uh, that are you know, sort of taking place right in front of us. And then, in fact, you know, you're, you're helping to produce. Yeah, I, I would imagine, Aaron, that you have much better insights on this than I do. So I'm going to say something, but I bet you you're the expert and much more thoughtful than I am on this. Um, I would go to the only angle of oftentimes people use information to their advantage and the other person's disadvantage. And this is, again, is to me, is how self-harm is so embedded in mm -hmm. society that we just know, right? Like when you say something and I'm like, ah, gotcha, Aaron. Like, I'm gonna use that against you because, right? And, like, and so we think of this frame as if I share my data, insurance companies are gonna act against me and like blanks and act against me. So we all have this recoil where like, I'm gonna keep it all private because I'm scared of how other people are going to use it against me. But it's, it's this hidden layer that we're a, we're a violent society in all these subtle ways. What if it wasn't like that? Uh, that that resonates uh, so deeply. And, and if I may, I'd just like to follow the question by um, also pointing out something that I found beautiful in, in your story, which is uh, the recognition that no matter how much data one has, uh, it's the choice to change behavior that allows mm -hmm. for all the possible benefit to unfold. And so I guess my, my question for you is how much did data matter in your own decision to turn inward and find that shift in perspective that enables all the rest of this. It's almost like data was the adult in the room, you know, like I'm a, a pouty, emotionally unstable child in my mind of like, give me this, give me that. Let me stay up late. Let me do this. And data had to be like, no, nope. You need to rein that in, Brian, like stop being so chaotic and stabilize yourself. And so really it was trying to wrestle, con not control, wrestle neutrality to keep myself in check uh, because of how in inherently unstable I am as a human and vulnerable and prone to making the same mistake literally thousands of times, which is just ridiculous. And so data really, to me, is uh, special in that it's powerful and it, it truly off, it stands up firmly with courage to me. Thank you. That's right. really insightful. Thanks so much, Aaron. Um, 
Brian, this has really been a wonderful uh, and very, very insightful conversation. And, uh, you know, I'm just I'm so grateful for your time and for the work uh, that you're doing. I want to reiterate to folks, you know, this this may seem like it's not uh, accessible and you might not have the you know budget or the team to be able to do this, but there's so much that, you know, insights and learning uh, that Brian has has generated and that's available uh, on his website, that there are a lot of things that that we can all uh, leverage and utilize to live kind of healthier uh, and better, uh, better lives, I think. And so, Brian, can you just remind us what the, the website address is? Yeah, it's blueprint.brianjohnson.co. Okay, but yeah, you can also just it. search for Project Blueprint and Brian Johnson, and there's some yeah. amazing, you know, videos and all your recipes and lists of supplements. It's really terrific how much uh, data you've uh, you've shared. And it really, I guess I would say, uh, I know it may seem intimidating and not practical, which is true. <laughs> also, uh, the the dietary plan I have there, you know, um, if you could just make those recipes, you can do them three or four days batch at a time, like just make your meals twice a week, only eat those meals, get good sleep. Um, and you're off to a great start. And so you can tackle, you can start this program. You can make significant changes in your life and you don't need to do all the stuff I'm doing. And if you can just get the basics, right, I think it might give you enough, you know, momentum to make the next steps, but it absolutely is doable. I hope that people don't feel overwhelmed by it because it really is doable with a little bit of effort. Awesome. Well, I, uh, for one, am, am really excited to, uh, to dive into it more deeply and, and to start to implement some of this stuff. So Brian, again, thank you so much for your time today and for your insights. It's really been terrific getting a chance to chat with you. Yeah. Great to be with you all. Thank you.